Hi folks, it's John with the Wingman 115 channel. We're here at our Las Vegas home base for SHOT Show. Location undisclosed. That's right, the uh, Skunk Works location. And uh, I managed to grab Dan Eastland. He is the owner, the director, the guy that sweeps the shop floor, everything at Dogwood Custom Knives. I'm owner, lead craftsman, floor sweeper, pot scrubber. Uh, for Dogwood Custom Knives and Heritage Knives, so which is the mid-tech version of Jack Dogwood. of all trades, then. I am. Now, Dan has a, a pretty huge line of knives out this year. We thought we'd lay them out, showcase them, because uh, he has some really cool stuff that uh, I know you folks want to see out there. So without further ado, Dan, Thank take you. it away, brother. Uh, this is uh, this pattern is actually new this year. It's a, I call it a carver's carving knife, the dogwood carver, because it is very literally a carving knife. Uh, when I was spending time with a lot of people camping, I noticed that the majority of what they did with their small companion knife was carving wood, right. bowls, sticks. So I just said to myself, well, if people are wood carving, why not make a wood carver's knife? So I spent a little time studying wood carving tools and the that's what came out is this little general purpose wood carving knife that has turned out to be a really handy utility blade as well. Uh, great for your everyday carry, cutting string, opening boxes, that sort of thing. So it's turned into a really nice companion knife. I like how um, it has that Warncliffe or sheep's foot design in the front. So mm -hmm. it's really a uh, historical look, old school look to it. Thank you. It's uh, so the old school. You know, it's it's safer. It's harder to stab yourself, but having the point drop all the way down like this, when you're cutting, you can put a phenomenal amount of pressure right there on that tip. So it is great for pattern cutting and that sort of thing. Again, utility knives for opening things because you can get an amazing amount of force right there at the tip of that knife. And. What's the thickness on the steel on this one? Uh, this one comes uh, 1 16th to 3 30 seconds. I prefer 1 16th for this knife. It makes it a very light knife. Uh, because the blade is thin, it displaces very little material. So it cuts even more efficiently. Uh, but some people like a little heavier blade, so we give the, the 3 30 seconds option as well. And then uh, what sort of scales are you running on this one? Anything that, any scale that we put on any knife in our lineup, can go on here. This happens to be a yellow heart, which is a, a South American wood. And that's actually, the, that's the natural color of the wood. Nice. Uh, but again, any of the synthetics, all of the woods that we offer on any other knife, we can put on here. No, it's, it's a really sharp looking blade. Thank you. And then the, the next step up is, uh, this is the cub. It is, in, it is very truly a pairing knife. It's the first utility knife I made, or companion knife. And I used a paring knife shape because as I was doing historical research, the paring knife is the absolute workhorse of the kitchen. Yeah. Deboning a chicken, opening mail, opening cans. I mean, this is what the stereotypical housewife or cook or chef, this is what they did everything with. And if it worked for thousands of years as a general purpose knife, that told me there was something there. Yeah, I like the uh, thought process of uh, historically w what you're doing and bringing it all together in your designs. Uh, a lot of people don't like to hear it, but there's nothing new in the knife design. Right. Ever since man used the first sh sharp chip of rock to cut something, I'm really short of the lightsaber. I think we've done everything that can be done. Yeah. So I like to go back and look at patterns that were proven over hundreds of years because if people used it for hundreds of years, there's something to that shape. Right. And then I look and see, can I apply modern t uh, materials to it? You know, these 1 16th inch blades, I like to use a lot of particle steel. It's very tough, it's got good edge retention, so I can start making thinner, thinner blades with higher grinds. So I can take these proven shapes and make them more efficient. I can start using some synthetic materials that makes the handle just as strong but lighter. Um, so it's one of the guiding principles is historic. We get our inspiration from histor from right. history and then try to improve on it with modern technology. Yeah, that, that's a that's a good uh, statement because we're we're really in a renaissance era now with the uh, 
super powdered steels, the super steels. I mean that the advantages that folks a hundred, two hundred years ago did not have. Oh, at absolutely. All. Uh, and it's we're in a really interesting place where knife skills are becoming important again. Right. Now less as a life or death measure, but a lot of skills that were nearly lost are coming back and people are starting to be able to appreciate finer blades. Uh, so I'm excited about what's going to be happening in the near future. Oh, yeah. And then this handle material is one, a collaboration that I did with Shade Tree Phenolix. Um, we call it Starry Night because it reminds us of the Van Gogh painting. Right. But it is a uh, twisted micarta, and then the small stones in the handles glow in the dark. Nice. And it's the same material as the Firefly. Up close, the, these are real beautiful uh, handles on these blades. It's just phenomenal. And then this, this is the flagship of our lineup. It's the Echo 5. It is one of my early woods knife designs. I wanted a general purpose outdoor tool. It's big enough that in a pinch you can do all your kitchen tasks with it. Uh, it's, it's got a little belly so you can do some big cuts with it. Uh, it's got enough length that, again, you can do kitchen tasks, you can, uh, you can process game with it. But it's small enough that it's nimble that when you're doing small carving tasks or if you want to choke up on it, you can dress game with it. So this is really our general purpose. If you got to cut it, this knife will do it. And you're using O1 tool steel? Uh, this one is O1. With a forced patina? Uh, that's, a, that's an actual forge scale. Oh, nice. Uh, during the heat treat process, you'll get a thin layer of carbon on the steel. And most people grind that away to make it shiny. Right. But I love the depth and the character that that puts in. Yeah. So I left it on. And this one is O1. Uh, th since this is a custom knife, you can get it in any steel you want. I like O1, I like the particle steels. I've been using a lot of uh, AEBL lately. Nice. Um, and then uh, this one led to the Heritage, that's the Echo 5. And then that led to the Heritage Echo 7, which is a mid-tech version of that knife. I wanted to get the price point down. I wanted to get these knives in as many hands as I could. And the only way I could really do that is start working in volume. Right. So we took the basic characteristics that were most functional and people seemed to like the most, put them into one knife, and then started making runs of 200, 250 knives. And that's gotten the price point down where this, you're looking 325, 350. This, you're coming in at 120 with a leather sheath. So a working man who's it, got a, a wife and about eight kids could afford to have a nice good quality blade and go out in the woods and practice exactly. skills or and these are built to the same standards as our customs they're just done in runs of 200 that are all the same and that gets our price point down nice and the handles and the blades are machined they're assembled by hand quality controlled so it's not fully handmade but you're still getting the quality control and you're getting a, a very reasonable price it's close to custom as you can get on, at, a, on a mass at this price mass, point yeah. yes uh, <laughs> my teenage boys and I assemble all of these by hand. Hey, there you, it's, a, it's a family affair. And this is a, one of my early patterns. It is the trail hiker. I, I do a lot of backpacking. And the requirements that I needed for a knife, especially when I'm on the AT and that sort of thing, yeah. were actually pretty light. So this is a little smaller than the Echo 5. It's, because it's smaller, it's significantly lighter. Uh, the curve in the handle makes it a little more compact to carry. So it's generally a, a lighter purpose knife. Um, it's designed where this is designed to go in the woods, off trail, whatever you want to do. This is a lighter knife. Uh, it's trail tasks, hence the name trail hiker. Yeah. Um, Camp cooking tasks, food prep. Opening packages, cutting cordage. You know, if you had to build a shelter with it, you could, but let's face it, when you're backpacking, you're usually... Yeah, putting the tent up and, and even smoothing you, it. Even if you get lost, you generally have your tent or your tarp. Right. And if you don't, you know, well, when I got lost mm -hmm. in the Amazon, that's what I had. So if I can get by on this, you can get by with that. There you go. Um, and then this is just a... Uh, this is an Echo 5, and it's just got a drop point, and you can see it's got the Firefly material. Uh, 30 minutes of direct sunlight on this material will give you 8 to 10 hours of glow. 
Uh, it's been great for survival knives. So let's talk about the backstory because you told that story earlier this week about how the idea for this came about. A couple of years ago, I was camping and we had very large rocks around the fire ring. And I was eating with my plate in my lap and I'd been looking into the fire and I set the knife, my knife down to do something and I turned around and I couldn't see it. And between being bl night blind from staring into the fire and the shadows that were being cast by these big rocks, I couldn't find the knife. So I was on my hands and knees and I was just hoping I'd find the handle before I found the blade. Yeah. And I came home from that trip and said, it's not gonna happen again. And I wasn't really happy with the glow in the dark materials that were on the market at the time. I felt like, I felt like with modern technology, we could get more efficiency. Right. So it's been about a two and a half, three year process coming up with this material. And I've been incredibly impressed. Like I said, 30 minutes of direct sunlight, eight to 10 hours of glow. Even if it's completely dead, uh, I put a piece in a bathroom, closed the door for 24 hours, no light. I turned on my flashlight, opened the door, stuck the flashlight in and said, one, two, three, four. Turned the flashlight off, looked in the bathroom, and though it wasn't growing, glowing brightly, it was standing out against the background. You're right. So even if it's completely discharged and you're trying to find your knife in a dark area, you can shine your light in the general area where it is, turn it off, and just look for that, that faint glow. Uh, I intended it for general purpose. Uh, a lot of the uh, emergency people like it um, for you know, literal emergency kits. They, right. This bright color makes it easy to see in full daylight, and then the glow in the dark makes it easy to find in low light and dark conditions. Uh, I've gotten a lot of interest from the dive community about it. Uh, we also make uh, zipper, zipper pulls out of it, or uh, these little pieces that you can string on the guidelines of your tent nice. or your hammock so you don't clothesline yourself at night. That is the key to internal happiness. If you just follow those four simple steps, you'll be happy for the rest of your life. We had technical difficulties for some reason here at SHOT. Your gear works fine at home, always. But whenever you need it, it it's something, a technical difficulty always comes up. SHOT is a lot of awesomeness for one, for one camera to it'll, try to contain. It'll suck the life right out of your camera. It just it does. <laughs> So yes, these zipper pulls, uh, they're available on the website. My kids generally make them out of scrap, so the supply isn't always consistent and they sell really quickly. We can take special orders for them. It, there's a little bit of lead time, but yeah, entirely possible. I'm gonna, yeah, and I'm gonna segue in uh, photos of them glowing. I mean, when you really see them in person, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. So that's a great item if you're in an environment where there's a lot of heavy duff in the woods. Like I go up to uh, the back country in San Diego, there's six to eight inches of just pine needle duff. If you drop a blade at night in that, yeah. you're not gonna find it. You might not even find it during the day. So with that, yeah, I could see I like that this. just popping out, you know? And that's why I like this bright daylight color. Some of the glow in the dark materials, in full light, they look, they look dim, they look flat. Right. And that's why I wanted to put this color in here, because in North Georgia, where I used to do a lot of camping, we'd get leaf clutter equally as deep, right. and the knife would just vanish. What I like about that, too, is you're offering it in a bunch of colors. There's orange, there's red, there's blues, there's yellows, there's even a purple color. Yeah. So the green, there's a little something for everybody's taste. There is, and we can cast it in custom colors. If somebody really has a strong desire for a, a certain color, we can make uh, custom runs. So that's pretty cool. Now, I see a, a knife that has a American flag on it. Can we talk about that real quick? I'd be glad to. Uh, I used to be in the infantry. Uh, a lot of my buddies still are, and they've been giving me a hard time about that. I made these smaller companion knives and these camping knives, but they wanted something American made. They wanted something carried, made by a vet. So I spent a lot of time deciding what I wanted the knife to be, and in the end, uh, I was studying a lot of, uh, a lot of historical knives, uh, particularly trade knives, which led me to the Bowie knife. And I decided if an American serviceman is going to carry a knife, it's got to be a Bowie. Yeah, heck yeah. So we started with the, we went back to the original Bowie straight drop point instead of the clip point. Uh, we call it the Aquila, which is the father wolf from the Jungle Book. Nice. Because he was also the lone hunter. Uh, we went with a synthetic guard rather than brass. It's not shiny. It's not metallic, magnet, or it's not magnetic. It won't shine. 
Uh, you don't have to have your hand against a really cold piece of metal. Uh, we can keep it flat. Every bit is strong, but it also allows us to do things like this American flag. Right. Um, so the pattern on this, or the, the image on this material goes all the way through the material. So when I shape it, the image keeps integrity. So whatever the image is, when I start shaping it, it stays. Uh, this uh, it's one of the only heavy blades I make. Uh, I will go as heavy as uh, 5 30 seconds with it. Uh, 1 8 is our standard. Uh, some of the guys like the 3 30 seconds for a lot of very disturbing reasons. So I'll go that route too. Uh, this is brand new. Well, we premiered the original version at Blade Show last year. Yeah. Uh, this handle material, I just found out about it a couple of weeks ago, and I am really excited about the potential. You know, we're doing things like skulls as well. Um, part uh, they've done lines from the Constitution, put into the handle, pin up girls. I'm talking to the company that makes this now about some custom runs nice. just for dogwood. So a lot of untouched potential here. So if somebody calls you and says, "Hey, they have a unique idea for something," you can pro you can steer them in the right direction and kind of. I can. Uh, now, this material, it's got to be done in a very, fairly large batch. Okay. So, if somebody's got their heart just set on something, we'll be more than happy to do it. Okay. But it's going to be fairly expensive. Yeah. You'll wind up having... But it'll a, be a one, one of a kind. Oh, absolutely. And any extra material, we'll be happy to send to them. That way, they've got the extra material, and they know that's the only knife that'll ever be like that. That's awesome. Why else do you buy custom? Yeah, and seeing that up close in, in the 3D flag, I mean, uh, it really yeah. pops. Yeah. And it almost has like a wood grain to it. It's just... It's a, yeah, it's got a layered material, so it's got depth. So it's three-dimensional, it's got depth. I haven't seen anything like it. Neither have I. That's why when you broke that out the other night, I was like, ooh, and you were like, don't even think about it. Uh, I've also started making uh, matching 1911 grips, Ooh. so you can have your pistol and your 19 or your knife and your 1911 and matching grips. There you go. Uh, this is the Kephart Redux. Uh, because we're at Shot Show, this has got a little more aggressive uh, false edge on the top. Right. Typically, I make it with just a single edge as a woodsman's tool. So, if folks want it, they can have it with a single edge. Correct. Okay. And generally, that's how I make it. Uh, some of my buddies. They don't, they don't like carrying that much knife. Right. Um, so this is a, a smaller, arguably more practical version. But should worse come to worse and it comes to cold, cold hard steel, this is something they can be confident in. Nice. Um, the blade shape is obviously influenced by uh, Horace Kephart's design. Uh, I decided to put my own take on it. So from about this point back, you can obviously see the differences. That's, that's my take. Right. But I wanted to be honest that this is obviously Kephart in influenced, so we call it the Kephart Redux. I like the liners mm -hmm. on that and the uh, a little bit of a Coke bottle mm -hmm. profile in the handle. It is. Uh, I studied with Andy Roy. Uh, that's where I did my apprenticeship. And he focuses a lot on contours. And I took that and then started talking to some people in the medical field about the structure of the hand. Uh, how the hand fatigues, typical injuries, right. and then started applying all of that to my handles. So they're, they're fairly distinct. No, they, it's nice clean lines on that. It looks really nice. People get very focused on the blade, right? and they forget that the handle is every bit important. That's, I would that's say how more your hand important. interacts. Yes. You know, as, as a reviewer, I, you know, if I'm using something and my hand starts hurting after five or ten minutes, you're not going to use the knife. And something else that has helped is I've been doing a lot in the culinary industry the last couple of years and working with chefs because you know, they're using their knife constantly, eight, ten hours a day. So anything, anything that was fatiguing or a problem, they can tell me about immediately. And I've worked with them to refine some designs as well. And That's by the way, this guy's a phenomenal chef. Thank you very he much. He cooked the other night and he just rocked the house. He he made it work in like less than an hour. I was seriously impressed. You know, you never trust a skinny cook, man. <laughs> That's if right. you got a build like this, you obviously know something about food. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm right there with you, man. <laughs> uh, and then along the lines of some of the traditional American uh, frontiersman blades or trade knives, 
Uh, this is the Hawkins knife. Um, and you know, the name's obviously inspired from the old Hawkins 50 caliber rifle. Right. Uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, the line is, uh, the main character finds a, a frontiersman that has died. And he's left a note that, you know, if any man, any man that finds me, if they'll bury me, they can have my Hawkins 50 caliber. Right. And the guy was so excited because that's what he had always wanted and couldn't get. And that, that mentality, that love for a tool stuck with me. So when I was making this pattern, I realized that you know, this was a pattern that I really wanted. And it's obviously frontier inspired. Yeah, I love that. When I see that, I picture like the Lewis and Clark days. We're heading out to parts unknown. We're going to explore. And uh, I love how uh, your thought process and the stories behind the the whole genesis of the knives that you uh, design is pretty cool. Thank you. They're, they are built to be used. Uh, this one, you can tell it's a little bigger than an Echo 5. Uh, that's so it's a little better at kitchen tasks. Uh, the only problem I ever had with the Echo 5 is I couldn't cut a baking potato in one slice. It's a little thing, but I'm a kitchen nerd. It annoyed me. So that was one of the things I wanted to incorporate into a, the bigger version of a knife. See, I, like the, I love the backstories on the design. And then this is brand new. This is number 002. It is called the Volpine. Um, it's, I didn't realize how badly I wanted to make this knife. Every so often I go through my sketchbook. I'm constantly sketching. And I realized that this knife in slightly different versions have been showing up in my sketchbook for years. And I realized there's got to be a reason. So I put it together. Uh, we've been field testing it for a while and I'm, I am really excited about this knife. Uh, it's very compact. It carries very easily, but as a general, it's small enough that it's a, a city everyday carry if you want to, but a phenomenal go into the woods knife. And a great working knife. The contours fit the hand really well. They lock in. Not at all fatiguing. I'm really excited about what's, what's going to happen with this knife. <clears throat> this is also brand new. Um, a friend of mine owns a, a couple of restaurants, and he wanted, he wanted steak knives that were really going to pop. So this pattern started out as a snake knife for him. <clears throat> And it was sitting on my bench, and I kept coming back to it. I kept coming back to it. The lines, it, the knife just spoke to me. So I started taking it to the woods with me. It is really good for processing freshwater fish. Uh, it's, you know, it's obviously a little smaller than the normal uh, fillet knife. Right. But for your panfish, your crappy, brim, even some of the largemouth bass, this has been a really convenient size. It fits the hand really nicely when you're doing a, a finger forward grip or if you want to put your thumb over. That curve makes a really nice slice. It has turned out to be a phenomenal general purpose, especially an angler's knife. Again, this one I think is the third one. Uh, the first two were still in field testing, but I'm very excited about what's going to happen with this block. I this know. I, I love the uh, curvature uh, <clears throat> of how it's almost like a yin and yang type. The handles complementing the, the, the blade, sort of like it's handing it off to it. It looks really nice. Yeah. A lot of people uh, refer to it as the, uh, the water knife or the water blade because they say the, the movement speaks to, to ripples of water. All right, so this is my 8-inch uh, chef's knife. Uh -huh. I always wanted to make kitchen knives, but when I did my apprenticeship, I couldn't find anybody that was making them. Right. So I did my apprenticeship. I've been doing outdoor knives for seven or eight years. But I've got a buddy in Atlanta that owns a series of restaurants. So I sent him the first version of this two and a half, three years ago. And it came back with Sharpie all over it. You know, more here, less there. So every three or four months, I'd send him another prototype. And a while back, prototype hadn't come back and it hadn't come back. So I called my buddy and I said, you know, are you going to send the knife back? He said, my knife? <laughs> I said, yeah, the prototype. He said, well, why would I send you my knife? Right. And I Oh, so I got it right? He said, yeah, that's the one. Nice. So we started producing that. Uh, we do a full line. We do a boning knife, a fillet knife, a paring knife, a vegetable cleaver, a meat cleaver, this 8-inch knife, and a 5-inch knife. And you can mix and match, get whole sets. Uh, any material that we make knives out of, you can get on the kitchen knives. Um, 
I tend to steer people away from some of the natural woods. Yeah. Because they require a lot of maintenance in the kitchen. But if you've got your heart set on it or you're, you're that proficient, you know, if it can go on a handle, we can make it for you. Nice. And these, I can do them in simple carbon. I've been doing them in particle steel uh, and AEBL. The AB- EBL is a little easier for some people to sharpen, but it's still got a lot of uh, stain resistance, corrosion resistance. The CPM 154 has been an absolute workhorse in the kitchen, though. Great edge retention, fully corrosion resistant. Um, and as long as you've got a diamond or a, a ceramic cone, it's a great steel. You'll bring it right back. Yeah. Yeah, so unless you're abusing <clears throat> it, I mean, if you just dress it up real quick, you... you you're going to keep it sharp for a long time. Eventually, every knife has to be resharpened, but yes, as long as you're diligent. And one of, the acknowledge, or one of the examples I got was from one of the chefs. He said, with my carbon steel blades, I'm touching them up every three or four minutes on the steel. He said, with that CPM steel, I don't have to touch it up until the end of the night, but rather than being six seconds on my steel, it's 10 minutes sitting down to sharpen it. Right. And he said, but the amount of time I save that... At the end of the night, I'll have a drink, sharpen my knife while the kitchen's getting cleaned up, and I'm done. And I'm not constantly picking up my hone to touch up my blade. That's nice. And then this is new. Uh, turns out that some of the guys I work with uh, down in Greenville were turning pins. So we started doing this gentleman set. So we'll either do a carver, carver nut style or this cub, and we'll turn a pin to match the handle. <clears throat> and it comes with this sheath. I know. It, it looks like a gentleman's set. And it's designed to be low profile and curved. So if it's in your pocket or if it's in a jacket, it doesn't leave an imprint. Right. And it can clip just inside the pocket so you can get to the pin or the knife as easily, one or the other. Yeah, because there's a lot of folks that don't want to carry a folder <clears throat> for whatever reason. Most of which are because fixed blades are vastly superior in every way. Yeah. At least until I start making folders. <laughs> and then folders are going to be just as good. <laughs> Equal to or greater than. <laughs> uh, these sheaths can be custom tooled. We've got uh, my leather, my sheath worker, or my leather worker, has a guy in house that does phenomenal tooling. Um, so just a little touch for when you're going to go out in town. Um, I can't tell you how many of these I sell for Father's Day. Yeah, or uh, Christmas. <clears throat> yeah. So... Um, if, if someone's looking to be an aspiring knife maker, would you have any words of wisdom to impart on somebody who's thinking about it? You got a young man, young woman out there. They're thinking about, hey, I want to I want to do this. I want to learn. Um, Some of the advice I got when I started was don't do it for the money. You don't make money as a knife maker. You have got to be a knife maker because you love making knives. Right. Fortunately, if you're really, truly passionate, then you tend to be able to in a situation so you can support yourself. But knife making is something you do because you love it, not because you think you're going to make a living at it. Uh, go back to your historical references. Um, again, if a pattern has been around for a long time, there's a reason. From the design standpoint, the first thing I ask myself when I'm going to make a knife is, what do I want this knife to do? Anything that will help that knife perform that task, I put in the design. Anything that will interfere with it, I take out. If it's neutral, then I'll consider leaving it in. But it really, you need to ask yourself in every aspect of the knife, how does this help the knife do that one task? There is no such thing as the perfect knife for everything. Right. There's thousands of saw blades. Saw blades, or saws themselves, have been designed over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands A of years. A long time. If there was one perfect saw, we'd have figured it out by now. Right. Each knife has a different shape or size to do general tasks. Figure out what task it is you want that knife to do and design it for that. Uh, other than that... There is no replacing experience. Get out there and make. You're going to learn more with your hands. Grinders, heat kilns, all of this stuff. People were making knives way before that. I made my first knife uh, when I was a kid. 
with a set of uh, metal files and a, a piece of flat bar. If that's the only resources you have, start using them. You're going to learn more by doing than you are by reading or listening yeah. or watching videos or so get out there, give it a try, make something, test it. If it works great, if it doesn't, that's even better because you just learn more. But get out there and do it. So with that, if folks want to learn more about you and about your knives and your knife line, how do they get a hold of you? Um, you can go to the website, which is www.dogwoodcustomknives.com. Uh, we've got the Dogwood Custom Knives Facebook page as well. And both of those have my contact information. Uh, the new website will also have uh, an e-commerce so you can buy directly from me or you can go to Edgeworks, which is uh, my preferred dealer right now. Actually, not right now. It's always been. He, Sean is a great guy to work with. Um, and then I'll, I'm sorry. I'll also be at Blade Show this year. And you're on Instagram. I am. Uh, Dogwood Custom Knives on Instagram. So if you folks are out there and you're looking, because I hear it in the comments all the time. Dude, we want 100% made in America, this and that and that. These are the guys right here that you uh, want to talk to. The mid techs are 100% American made. Uh, the blades are made in Ohio. The handles are made in North Carolina. See. Uh, assembled in South Carolina. Uh, the custom stuff, I do it all in house. The heat treat, the handles, the blades, it's all in house. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sitting down and uh, oh, thank chatting you very with much. me. It's and, a pleasure. Uh, I'll leave all the links below on how to contact Dan in the video description. Thanks for watching, folks.